Greetings ladies and mandalgens, and welcome to this latest episode of Tales, Tales from, from Outer from Space. Outer space. Taken from the subreddit HFY. The links to all the stories will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please consider subscribing. Story number one. Terror Valley, written by Alt Cipher. The air hung thick in the heavy and cramped bar. A dozen species drank from mugs filled with mixtures of foul and sweet, bitter and sour and none of the good for the patron drinking them. Dim lights reflected dully off their eyes and mandibles and face plates. Kessick slid into a bar stall next to an opposing Snexian, an avian species over two and a half meters in height and a terrifying tuddens and a brutal beak, all designed to tear and rend. Kessick barely came up to the Snexian's chest, coming from a smaller Mamillion lineage whose evolutionary history was based on hiding from threats choosing fight over fight. You look new here, Kessig said after ordering. The bartender passed him a small glass of dark green liquid. The Snexian looked down with his beak with a small creature who was sharing the bar with him. I am, the Snexian said, his deep voice full of disdain. Kessig sipped his drink gingerly. Ah, he said, wiping his dainty mouth. I thought as much, passing through. No, the Snexian said, his back ramrod straight. Eyes locked ahead. Oh, you're looking to stay. With a sigh, the Snexian said, looking to settle, if you must know. A new neighbor. How exciting. There are many wonderful homesteads to the west of town. Wonderful developments, vibrant communities. We're expanding every day, Keswick said. I will not be living there, the Snexian said. Ah, more of an urban dweller. Well, the east side of town is near the ports, so it is a bit crowded and noisy. The central core is governmental, and there's a small art scene in the southern part of the city. Now if you're... I will not be living in the city, the Snexian said, and you bother me, prey animal. Keswick snapped his eyes back to the drink and started downwards for a moment. I see, he said, his voice hushed and low. The Snexian took a slow pull from his drink and glanced at the Keswick, who looked over all the world like he was trying to sink into the bar top. The Snexian raised an eyebrow. Bora, he said, my name is Bora. His voice had softened, but only just. Keswick turned to face him and said, A pleasure to meet you, Bora. I mustered out of the military last month, Bora said, and am not yet accustomed to civilian life. I do not find cities and crowds appealing. I apologize for my tone. Oh, think nothing of it, my friend, Keswick said, a smile spreading across his face. Have you decided on a likely place yet? Bora clicked his beak once and then deciding whether or not to reply. Yes, he said, eventually. There is a mountain range some thirty kilometers from the city. I shall make my home on the lowest slope of one of those mountains. Thirty kilometers, you say? Would those perhaps be roughly north and west of the fire city? Keswick looked down and picked up a bar as he spoke, avoiding Bora's eyes. Roughly, yes, Bora replied. A small lake in a green valley near the mountains... I believe there may be a lake, yes. Keswick drained his glass in one hurried gulp. Can I live there, my new friend? I'm sorry. Bora shot up from the bar stall in the flesh. Who are you to tell me where I may make my home? The bar fell silent as the giant Snexian roared his question. I am a no one, Keswick said, but I would like to be your friend. Bora laid a heavy talent hand on Keswick's shoulder and spun the smaller being around and glared him in the eyes. Kessick could feel Bora's hot breath roll over him. I do not wish to be friends, Bora said. I wish for respect and solitude, but I will settle for fear and avoidance. I will honor your wishes, friend Bora, but you must not build your home near that valley. Kessick squeaked out. His bowels threatened to let loose at any moment and he could feel the sour bile rising up in the back of his throat. I will do as I please, Bora yelled as he stood up and surveyed the room. What's going on? Jess, the local peace officer, had entered the bar. One of the patrons had scurried out as soon as Bora started up and caught the container. This is pitiful, weak, miserable shell of a creature trying to tell me where I can or cannot build my home, Bora yelled. That doesn't sound like Kessick, Jess said. He's usually pretty friendly, Kessick. Uh, my, uh, new friend here, uh, Bora, was, um, uh, talking about building his home, Kessick stammered out. And you offered opinions, Jess asked. 
Kessick nodded. Did you tell him about the homesteads to the west of town? Kessick nodded, yes. Bora interrupted. I will not live Quill and Cloaker with a thousand other creatures. Never again. Jess nodded. Well, there's plenty of space. I will build my home on the slopes of the mountains in the north and the west, Bora yelled. Jess said. Oh, I see. He looked at Kessick, who was trying to make himself small and easily overlooked as possible. Did you tell him? I was about to, Kessick said, but he, um, had issues with hearing my advice. Advice, you worthless piece of a... Uh, it's called Terror Valley, Jess said. Bora stopped short. Your local legend's of no concern to me, he said. The last eight homesteaders that went up there never came back, Jess said. We found the bodies of a couple of them, eventually. The rest... Well, they were just gone. Fools and weaklings will always find a way to die. Bora said, I'll make my home where I please. Jess shrugged. No law against it, he said, but there are laws against brawling and being a public nuisance, so I'm going to have to ask you to settle down or leave this establishment. Bora glanced around briefly and saw the whole room staring at him. Well, he was certain that he could take any one or maybe even two of them in a fight. He knew that he couldn't take all of them if it came to that. He saw Jess's hand casually resting on the small but angry-looking sidearm, and saw Kessick keeping his head down and ready to bolt at a moment's notice. Bora turned back to the bar momentarily and slammed the rest of his drink back, then turned back to Jess in the front door. Fine, he said. Might as well get started on my new home. He strode out of the bar with his head held high. Kessick let out a breath that he'd been holding for several long minutes. How is tense, he said half to his drink and half to himself. Kessick, Jess said, what the hell were you thinking? I was being friendly. You know the Snexians are high strung, Jess said, sitting down next to the Kessick. He seemed nice enough at first. You mean before you started talking to him? Well, yeah. So what's his story? He said he just got out of the military and was looking for a homestead, Kessick said. I offered several likely places then, uh, well, you heard. Military, Jess asked. Did he say that he was in the war? He didn't say, but he must have been, right? Must have been. And he's going up in the valley. I tried to warn him, Jess screeched. So did you. Ah, Jess said, looking back at the door Bora had just left. Guess that'll bring us to nine bodies here shortly. Do you, um, do you think that we should have spelled it? Jess turned back to Kasek. Creatures like that are in the situation he was in. He wouldn't have listened anyway. He'd have thought it makes him look weak. If anything, he'd have run even faster. Still, Kessick said, it always sounds like T-E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, and that's what everyone hears. Maps all show it as T-E-R-R-A, though. Jess said, he goes up there and finds a crazy old human. He'll learn soon enough. End of story. Story number two, The Game, written by Voodoo Attack. What is it? Why have you brought me to this old terminal? Asked Anadulva with a curiosity as it crossed his hind arms. This, this is something you're gonna like, I think. Remember when you asked me what I like to do in my spare time? Asked Amelia as she fiddled with the computer's controls. I just need to set the emulator to the right settings and configure the old virtual machine to link to work with your implants. Hang on. Please do hurry. I must return to the delegation with haste, he told the technician impatiently. And there. It's ready. Now accept the media uplink request with your implants, please, said Amelia with a hopeful smile. Gnadolva hesitated, but complied. It accepted the request with a thought, wondering what the human technician had in mind. Immediately, it was greeted by a screen with a single button that said, Start Emulator. It mind-clicked it, and was blown away immediately, as another screen opened and the music started playing. It started with a tentative beat, something a media would later identify as drums, something that humans used to beat upon in some of their music. Then the chorus began, strong male voices mixed with string and brass instruments, the strength of the chance was overwhelming. It could not make out the language despite the implants having a full lexicon of all known languages in the universe. The implants were working in overdrive trying to translate it as the gondolva listened, rooted in place. And the music didn't stop. It just escalated and escalated in a never-ending crescendo. 
Then there was a lull as the brass instruments came back in force, followed by the powerful chorus. Then another lull, and a female voice hummed sweetly. Then the male chorus exploded again. Well, why haven't you started the game yet? Amelia tried to ask, but Gondolva didn't respond. It was lost to the music. It gave its implants the signal to broadcast the feed over to Old Crook, and the station was immediately alerted to the availability of the broadcast, including the ambassadors of the delegation. All were curious and soon accepted it. As more and more implants linked to the feed and their result was a pooled computing power, subtitles soon appeared. A full neural translation module was soon available, and every Ogrook listened to suddenly fluent and available vocabulary. Then the feed hit a local quantum relay and the streamed across the known universe to every Ogrook in existence, and then spread into impostations across the galaxy. And countless races on remote farming worlds heard that chant and hummed. There was an intellectual riot when Gondolva finally dared to press the new game. Fourteen hours later, Gondolva was observed leaving Amelia's quarters while humming a song. A song that every Ogrook and plethora of other races in the universe were currently humming, and the world hummed for a long time to come. Dovakin, Dovakin, now Oxen Los Varin. It was how the universe was introduced to the human video game which became a major export in short order. Human computer systems and gaming consoles were suddenly a much-desired commodity across the known universe, especially in the Haruk homeworld of Argon, the de facto trading capital of the universe, where human video game programmers, artists, and especially musicians were treated like royalty in the centuries to follow. It was also how a gullible technician introduced a new language to the galactic community at large, a language which was later officially adopted by a reptilian race originating from a watery moons of the Surian solar system somewhere in the far reaches of the Sarayan arm. End of story. And that, my friends, is the end of the video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author, check the links down below for the original link. But if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways listed down below. But the easiest would be to share this with as many people as possible to help the channel grow. And I will see you all in the next video. And until then, I hope you all have a good one. Cheers.